Good evening, everybody. Good evening. If I could ask you to take your seats, please. Hello. Now, some of you were here for the afternoon, so you know what's happening, and some of you are just here for this evening, and so I, we'd like to take the chance to explain what's happening. My name's Adam Smith. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach, and I've had the enormous pleasure of working very closely with Professor Tiki Pang from the NUS Medical School, a School of Public Health, um, on the curation of the program for this Nobel Prize dialogue on the future we want together. And this evening is the culmination of, a, of two years' work and also a full day of programming. And I'd like to invite Tiki on stage, please, just to give an overview of part of the dialogue, and then I'll fill in some other pieces, and then we will begin. So, Tiki Pang. Uh, good evening, everyone, and apologies for those of you who heard me this afternoon. Last Saturday was the Mid-Autumn Festival, and it's usually celebrated by consuming mooncakes. So you may ask, why mooncakes? Why the moon? In Chinese mythology, Princess Chang'e lived on the moon with her white jade rabbit. I'm not going to tell you a personal story. On the 20th of July, 1969, I watched the moon landing with my late grandmother in front of a black and white television set in our home in Jakarta, Indonesia. As Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, I turned to grandma and I said to her, to her as a smart aleck young teenager, you see grandma, there's no princess and there's no white rabbit on the moon. So from now on, you can stop celebrating the Mid-Autumn Festival. Grandma smiled, looked at me, and this is what she said. How do you know that we are looking at the same moon? <laughs> that stayed with me forever, so the moral of the story is clear. We all see different things. We all have very different views of the world. Thinking of my own children, it's clear to me that their view of the world is very different to the view of the people in my generation. So based on that context, and because the future we want together belongs to the young, we decided when we were planning the dialogue that the young should be at the heart of the dialogue that we had today. Those of you who were here this afternoon will notice we had an amazing participation from young people from many countries in this part of the world. And basically what I want to do now, could I ask all those student participants to stand up, stand up please? Can you stand up the students that have participated in the dialogue? Let's give them a round of applause. It was just an amazing uh, session. And I'll hand over uh, uh, back to Adam to say a few more words about how we got to this point. Adam. Thank you. And I should say that it's through the generosity of the NUS Medical School that, the, um, that so many of these students who participated are able to be here today through bursaries to travel, those who were not present in Singapore already. So thank you. Thank you to Yap Seng Chong. Um, we wanted to involve uh, the young in the dialogue, and so we recruited the help of the Asian Medical Stud Students Association based here uh, at the NUS Medical School. And through a tremendous effort, they put together a, a call for participants, which went out across the Asia-Pacific region. 
and they put together a very elaborate selection procedure. And many applied, and a few were successful. And those that are successful, you see, a, you saw a snapshot of them now, um, were invited to join conversations with Nobel laureates. We held six conversations on six different themes before today. Uh, in each case, one Nobel laureate would join 12 or so students for 90 minutes of discussion. And all of those discussions are being released tomorrow on NobelPrize.org, where they'll all be visible. So there'll be nine lovely hours of content of discussion about the future we want between the next generation and six Nobel laureates. Those students and the ideas that came out of those discussions have very much fed the conversations that we've been having today, this morning, this afternoon, and now this evening. And so for this evening's panel, what we want to do is reflect very briefly on some of the findings, some of the key ideas that have come out of all of these discussions. The Nobel Prize dialogue is all about conversations and just letting ideas out there for people to bathe in. And tonight, we'd like to let you bathe in some more of those ideas. And so what I'm going to do is invite a panel of experts to, uh, to come up on the stage, Nobel laureates and others. And then we're going to be visited by representatives of each of the six themes that we visited. And they're going to tell us what the key ideas were. And then the panel is going to discuss it. So may I invite the panel to join us on stage, please? Thank you. I have a seating plan here. Uh, so, um, Serge, you're there, please. Um, Kailash, I'm oh, sorry, I'm reading it, I'm reading it backwards. Am I getting it right? I think so. Have we got enough seats? I think so. Uh, uh, where's George? George, you're here. I'm hiding. You're here. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. You said you could probe me. Sally, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> we can have Kailash, you're there, and take the, uh, that's it. That's that wasn't fantastic. much of an argument. Please sit down. Okay, so please let me introduce uh, uh, George Smoot, 2006 Nobel Laureate in Physics, Dame Sally Davis, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, Serge Harosh, who is uh, 2011, I think, or 12, uh, Nobel Laureate in Physics, Kailash Satyarathi, who is 2015 Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. Tegu Dartantu, yeah. who is Dean of the College of e Economics and Business at the University of Indonesia. And joining us virtually from Norway, Maybrit Moser, Nobel Laureate in Medicine. Maybrit, very nice to see you. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Nice to see you. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, absolutely. Can you right. hear me? Yes, yes, beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, the idea is that uh, we'll be visited by two student representatives from each of these themes that have been discussed. And they were the two students who participated in panels this afternoon. And the first panel was on digital uh, well-being. So, uh, may we have the two digital well-being students, please? Okay, if you'd just like to say your names and where you're from, and then give us your, your brief it's encapsulation. Okay. It's okay. Hello, my name is Walton. I'm from Duke and Yes Medical School here in Singapore, originally from Hong Kong. So uh, the first point that I would like to make is that the implementation of technology matters. Not just the technology, but how, why, and where we use this technology. Uh, an issue that was raised up in the conversation was the bias in designs whether it be ethnicity, race, or the context of the technology that is in question. So that's my point. Hi, I am Aksa Shafiq, and I am from Pakistan. I am a graduate of CMH Lahore, and currently doing my postgraduate in public health from Health Services Academy. Today, we discussed the requirements AI presents to us, and the permission it requests from us. And it presents us a choice where we can be bound to our AI or we can choose to leave AI. So we are at a fork where we have to decide and strike a balance between both. And this requires a universal uh, standpoint where we might need policy making or some universal board which makes us realize how we are going to go about it in future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, both of you. That was marvelously succinct. 
Now, uh, thank, you, thank you. You're going to keep your microphones in, pe in case people want to come back to you. But we have only 10 minutes for each of these topics, so uh, I'm going to have to ask my panel to make short comments. Not everybody has to comment on every theme. But who would like to jump in on either of the points made by those two? Anybody? Go ahead, okay. yeah. Serge. Um, yeah, it's of the uh, digital is, is uh, you know, it's, uh, ongoing. I think it's already um, disrupted all uh, activities. Uh, yeah, as a part of my, my, my job is in education. But I think so, uh, we have to also to think about uh, the issues on, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, as, as development economist, so my concern is about there is a limit of, of uh, digitalization or digitization in our, our life. So maybe we also have to concern about the issues on, on digital divide because uh, maybe those who are living in developed countries, maybe there is no much problem on the access of the network, access to the devices, and access to the usage of the internet. But those who are living in, in a very diverse country like Indonesia, and that the network is, is, is not uh, equally developed all over the world, maybe the problem will be uh, uh, in digital divide will increase the, the future of uh, inequality. For example, in the issues of the digital divide, I think so my research has shown that during the pandemic, uh, the digital divide increased the divide of uh, uh, income. So because of um, the top level or, or the, the rich, uh, they can do the workings uh, from home, but for the low income people, uh, they, they have to, to work uh, in person or on site. So I think so we have to think about even though uh, this is very, very big topic and the future topic, uh, the digital, but we have to, to concern about the issues of, of uh, uh, digital divide, issues of in inequality, because this is our, our future. Yeah. If it is, uh, the, the world is in balance, I think it's not good for, for our future. So I think so we, we need to, to improve the, uh, yeah, expanding the, the access, uh, equal access to the network access to the devices and also improving uh, usage. But the important thing is improving the, the knowledge. The knowledge how to use the, the, the digital, how to use the internet for, for the good thing. I think this is my, 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 my concern about the issues on, on uh, digital uh, future. Thank you, Tegu. Serge, you wanted to come in. Okay, <clears throat> I, I, I ha had this discussion with the students when they pre-recorded the video and I found it very interesting because we shared a lot of ideas about, of course, the advantages of the digital world, but also of the problems it raises and all the pitfalls and the challenges it raises if you want to use it efficiently and in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, in fact, uh, we discussed a lot uh, the fact that uh, we get a huge amount of information from outside through uh, uh, the internet, through the social media, and we have to be able to filter this information, to be able to uh, uh, be fed by it in a way uh, which allows us to keep our own uh, vision of the world, our own interpretation of what, of what we get from it. And uh, this is a particularly important uh, in the case of children. So we discuss a lot about uh, the, the advantage and the dangers of uh, giving access to children too early to, to this uh, uh, digital world because children need to relate, to learn, to be trained and to learn how to relate to the world, to, to other people with, uh, in the real world and not through uh, the virtual world that the, uh, the internet uh, gives them access to. And this is one very important aspect that some of the students who are in the medical uh, profession uh, mentioned, and we discussed that point. We, want also, we also discuss the fact that uh, when you are on the internet, the people who think that they get that they get something from the internet, in fact, are the pro produce which is being used, that the internet manipulates, sometimes manipulates them, use them as something which is valuable that they, they can sell on the market. And this uh, reminded me 
of a novel by uh, Nicola Gogol in the 19th century called Dead Souls. The Dead Souls uh, were the slaves that the uh, owners, the Russian rich people owned, and then when a slave, a serf died, he remained on the rolls until the next census, and they had to pay uh, taxes for them. And so this uh, produced a market for people who were buying and selling dead souls for a economical advantage. And on the internet, you have a lot of dead souls. You have a lot of bots. You have a lot of people who don't, do not exist. Even when people die, they stay on, on the internet. And this produced a lot of money. Now, you see that Twitter is going to be sold. And the big controversy was, how many followers do you have on Twitter? to define the value of Twitter. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Gogol described more than a century ago. And I think it's fitting to uh, talk about that because Gogol is very close to Google. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is something which we have to take into account. But of course, I don't want to diminish the value of the internet. We will not be able to go back. We have to live with it, but we have to try to control its effect on the population. Uh, just to conclude, I, I think we have to make a comparison between uh, what happened six centuries ago when the printing machine was invented, the books came out, and this changed our way to relate to knowledge, but it took one or two or three centuries before it reached the, the, the global population, even more than that. Now, the internet has reached maybe half of the world population within 10 to 20 years. This fantastic acceleration has consequences, has very deep effect on the psychology, sociology, and the economy of the world. And we have to take this into account, try to understand it, to, uh, to be able to take advantage of it and not being completely overwhelmed by it. Thank you very much indeed. OK, I'm proving to myself that it's impossible to deal with this subject in 10 minutes. I think we might have to give myself, I might have to give myself 12 and a half minutes for each topic and we'll just have to run over because everybody wants to come in. Kalash wants to come in. I certainly want to hear my Brit on the idea of what it's doing to childhood development, but really try and keep your comments to a, a minute if you can. Kalash, go. Two uh, quick comments. One is uh, digital divide is so we knew that during last one and a half year, not now, but since the pandemic began, 1.6 billion children remained out of school during yeah. lockdowns and so on. And 40% of them had no access or very little access to online learning. So pandemic has exposed and exacerbated many of the problems which, or injustices which we have been facing, this is one of them. Again, the children were the worst sufferers. But it also relates to an important thing, and that is the democratization of knowledge. If knowledge is controlled, or sophisticated knowledge is controlled by a few people in few countries, in fewer hands, that becomes a knowledge apartheid. So it is very important that how, when the states, the politicians are not democratizing knowledge or not, they are not even democratizing uh, the politics or the governance, it is important that how young people, how the academicians, scientists, take the lead in democratization of knowledge and most sophisticated knowledge. So knowledge is created by all, knowledge is created for all, and knowledge is uh, used by everyone. The second thing is about the artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, artificial intelligence, which is supposed to be the problem solver in many sectors of life and society, it is again being controlled and must or married with information technology, that is obvious, um, social media, which is again controlled by certain sections of society and manipulated in their own way. So social media is good 
in spreading knowledge and information, but on the other hand, it is being misused and manipulated in uh, distributing that material which pollutes the mind of people. It is online child sexual abuse, it is extremism, it is uh, xenophobia, it is violence, and it is uh, creating loneliness in the society, uh, in individuals' lives. So it's a combination of all these factors. So how to challenge that situation and try that the combination of social media, <coughs> I'm not talking about the control on social media uh, in a democratic world, but it is necessary or it is important that information technology should not be used for these kind of purposes. Information technology and artificial intelligence combo can definitely help in solving the problems related to health, education, and protection. We can go for surveillance of uh, uh, surveillance to check many of the crimes in the society, especially the crimes against children, including sexual abuse and trafficking. We can also use uh, this technology, artificial intelligence, in uh, spreading uh, love and compassion and kindness and humanity in place of or against uh, the hatred and divide. Thank you very much indeed. My Brit, do you want to say something? No, you're not allowed to say anything, George, for this one. I'm sorry. You're going to you're gonna have to save it up. I was going to say controversial stuff. Oh, well, you, save it, you can throw it in in a minute. Um, my Brit, do you want to say just one minute of something on, on uh, childhood development? I, yeah, I, I would try to be short. I, I think that uh, exactly as uh, Kailash said, uh, we have some governments who really try to control the information that uh, the people get. I think it's important to give all information to people. And I'm so old, typically I say that I'm from the dinosaur age, where people discuss, should we be allowed to see color in our television? Should we be allowed to see this or that? I think that what the society can do is to give all information, but also train uh, the people in values and also if possible that we go together and give a lot of good activities to the young ones and that is what we learned now uh, through this pandemic that when we isolated people from each other we are social creatures when we are isolated it's an awful situation <coughs> and 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 of course Everything can be used against us and uh, against uh, a normal development. But I think that uh, to, to, to be open and not to control the information and rather guide, uh, uh, especially the young ones, how to, to, to deal with information and how to sort facts from humbug or terrible things. And, and as I said, to, to, to try to, to, to keep uh, children and even adults in activity, um, in good activities. And as we heard Kailash said, increase compassion in society. And we can do that even through internet. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, no, we're gonna move on. Um, thank you very much indeed. Ne so, we, so we dealt with digital well-being. The next theme we dealt with was well-being in the face of climate change. And two lovely students are going to join us now to give their views. Hock, Hock and Elaine, would you like to tell us what you, what you came up with? Uh, hello, um, my name is Park. Uh, I'm a climate change and sustainability consultant at EY. Um, I'm currently based in New Zealand. Uh, so Elaine and I were just talking, and I think just to recap the session on climate change, we all agreed that it's, it's seriously an issue that requires so much urgency, uh, it's, but it also has far-reaching consequences in just about every dimension of what we've been talking about across peace, across education, um, across health outcomes. And so uh, the, the time for real change is needed. Um, 
more than ever. Um, I made it a mission to talk about climate justice, and I, this, this diagram has actually traveled with me across from New Zealand, and I thought I'd just share it with you real briefly. Hold the mic. Um, sorry, so uh, this feels like a weird um, presentation, but what you see over here um, is actually three different um, kind of lines, three different lines, essentially. Um, and what we're seeing is that the global south has emitted within its fair share of the planetary boundary. Mm. It's right here. And you see Pakistan even lower beyond there. And what we see is that um, the global north, and that is the more rich developed countries, such as Europe, uh, such as the UK, US, New Zealand, and Australia, Israel, have exceeded that boundary since 1939. And they are now on trajectory to produce five times beyond that our planet can hold in terms of emissions. When I look at that, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Um, when I look at that, I get a bit nervous. Um, and especially when Pakistan's being hit by the worst floods we've seen so far, but yet they're emitting way beyond what, uh, they're, they're emitting at a much lower level than any other region is. And so I guess the question is, how can we talk about well-being right now when there is such disparity in the world what are we even doing to close that disparity? And do you have any thoughts on that? And it's a matter of justice. I'll pass it to Elaine. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much. Uh, my name is Elaine. I'm a junior doctor from Malaysia. I do not have much um, questions to ask, but I would rather ask the audience themselves. Because my perspective comes from health in terms of climate change. And when we talk about this, if you know, things that we're discussing since the pre-recorded sessions until now, it sounds very fancy to me, to be honest, because I'm coming from a global South countries, and we are trying, to, and there's a question that appears in my mind. If we can't really ensure equitable healthcare access to everybody, and some people don't even have choice to have food, they can't even make that choice, they don't, because they don't even have a choice how can we talk about consumerism in their own countries? And with this, climate change goal cannot be attained if all these countries are left behind because we are moving in the global, like in, in one, in solidarity. And I think this is very important for us to realize we have the generational task to complete the cycle, to fix the fragmented pieces and to work towards the goals that we want to achieve. And um, I'm excited that today, health lens is being applied on climate change because very like for so many years we have talked about climate change but i think climate change in the end is not just about energy and sustainability it's more about human health and well-being how can we live together with this environment happily to ensure us and the planet they are healthy and like kailash said if we live with compassion if i be a doctor with compassion if I care about every living creature in this world, I think it would be powerful if all of us can do so, because we would do so much for climate change. And youth today, that's a question for us. How do we move forward? That's the answer that we have to find out. And I think interdisciplinary would be the only solution for that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, not small questions. <laughs> um, Sally, you haven't spoken yet. Coming from a public health standpoint. Thank you. They are difficult questions. Uh, and I would be lying if I said I knew the answers. But when you get such complexity that matters to everyone, people are often kind of almost frozen into inaction. And what we have to find a way and I, I think we see it in some of the young, is how we each do small things that together add up to something much bigger. And what is it that will begin to galvanize us all on how we work as individuals? I mean, just at the moment uh, in Europe, we have energy prices going through the roof. It allows us to begin to say, we've been overheating our houses. Now that sounds almost irrelevant, but if you drop the heating in houses and put in insulation, the energy need is dramatically reduced. 
So we need, and actually people would be perfectly healthy, we need to, I think, move from being frozen to doing the small things while we look for the big things where we can get enough consensus. But it's not going to be easy. Thank you very much indeed. George, you haven't spoken yet. Do you want to address this one? <laughs> Are you afraid? Yes. <laughs> okay. Fusion. Give us fusion. I'll give us fusion. I, I will. Actually, we can do that. But le let me say some stuff. First of all, I'm not a human chauvinist completely. <laughs> Only a little bit. We, I don't believe we're the highest civilization and the highest intellects and planners and designers for the future that exist. In fact, it's clear that lots of places are screwing up. <laughs> okay. Now, way back, I was gonna tell some history before, but you didn't let me do the digital. Way back in 1973, we had an energy crisis. And at that point, the US government put extra funding into the laboratory that I work at in Berkeley. And we had to study the energy crisis and deal with the kind of stuff. And people started studying the issues of energy efficiency and many other things and what the, what the power you know, grid and what the power sources and energy sources are gonna look like in the future. And I got pulled into that because one of my friends who started the Particle Data Group went to be on the California Energy uh, Conservation Committee, you know, whatever it is, and started setting new standards for appliances and so forth. And California reduced its energy intensity per unit economy to be equal to that of Europe which was our pattern model of something good, which was about half of what it was in the other states. And it had to do with lining incentives for power companies. It had to do with getting rid of vampire energy. That is, you know the main energy loss in your house is either refrigerator or refrigerators are much more efficient than they used to be, or the fact that you have things plugged in that engineers didn't design to be zero power that you use to charge your phone or whatever it is, and they're plugged in and you walk, or instant on TVs, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. They, were in, they use up a fair amount of energy. So without changing the standard living, we were able to reduce the energy intensity by over a factor of two per unit, whatever it was. However, in the studies, it was very clear that the growth of people's economy had to do with the growth of energy that was available. And of course, we're stealing hydrocarbons out of the ground to get that energy for the most part, although there are other sources now. And we're, we were slowly developing more energy efficiency, both in houses and in, in appliances, but in alternate forms of energy. And, and, and one of the great success stories was the development of the white LEDs, so you can use them. So there is stuff going on, but when I looked at the studies, it was very clear that the demand for energy in the world was going to increase significantly over time. And it has, it stayed pretty much on those curves. And that requires tremendous investment uh, of the people. And when I looked at the numbers, and I was under review panels or doing the calculations, the, the numbers were huge. And it turns out that of, of the 10 biggest projects ever done by human, six of them are about energy resources. That includes the Great Wall and the pyramids, right? And three or four of them in Australia. One's an oil terminal, big oil terminal, and one's a big coal terminal, right? And so you look at what's going on and you realize that using those hydrocarbons allowed us to have a prosperous present, but we need to find alternatives and we need to find a way to go to being efficient and careful and we have to worry about it but when I looked at the numbers, the amount of money spent on these huge projects is incredible. When I looked at the numbers, if you spent less than 10% of that on additional projects, you could provide energy to everybody in the world. Now, you've got to need, there's about one and a half billion people from Bangladesh through Northern India, through Pakistan, that are going to need electricity and air conditioners, or they're going to die. I mean, they got, you know, and it's not that long till they're going to. So, if I were king of the world, which we'll talk about later, I hope, <laughs> I would have said, okay, there's a tax on all energy and infrastructure for the world, and I'm gonna make sure everybody in the world has access to, to power so they can also get on the internet and do a lot of other stuff. And in fact, we even made a small, through the project in Kazakhstan, we even made a small kiosk that has solar cells on the top that you could put out in the Africa 
wild, and people can bring their cell phones in and charge them from the phone, and they can get a connection to the internet. And it's cheap, right? But you've got to use the new technology to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Serge. Yeah. <clears throat> I would like to make two or three uh, short points. The first point is that we are exhausting the resources of the Earth. It's clear. So, and we have to reduce, uh, to suppress completely our uh, spending of uh, fossil fuels, which means that you have to find other energies. And these other energies will be required in larger amounts, as you have said. And for one very simple reason, the population of the Earth is still increasing. We are now set between seven and eight billion, so it will be 10 or 11 billions by 2050. And so we have more people, and each of them will require, of course, more energy because we want uh, to diminish the inequalities which we were talking before. So we need a lot of resources. And at the same time, we need also to make sure that the population does not keep increasing, that is, the number of children per uh, person should decrease, especially if you want people to live until, until 100 years, which is a very uh, positive goal. It means mathematically that you need less children because if people live longer, the population will increase. So these are very challenging issues and we have to find new sources of energy. Now, if you look, if you want to find solution, you need science. Only science will give answers, not ideology. And I will give you one example. It's quite clear that if you want to meet this challenge, we need, we need nuclear energy. And the nuclear energy has been cancelled or is, has been decreased for ideological reasons. When I talk to some of my colleagues in Germany or in Sweden, they don't even want to discuss. It's a kind of taboo topic, even among scientists. Or I can tell you we need nuclear energy, and, uh, at, at least as a tran transient energy until the 2050s. And there is a big problem now which relates us to the last point I wanted to stress. We will not solve this problem if it interferes with geopolitical issues. The, the, the war in Ukraine is giving us a very uh, striking example of what will, may happen and would be very bad. The nuclear power plant in Ukraine is now in danger of being bombed and there is a lot of fear, justified fears about that. Nuclear energy was safe before that, almost, it had never killed people. And now there are reasons to be afraid of nuclear energy because of that. And if nuclear energy cannot be exploited as it should, we have a big problem. Okay. If we keep mining coal and mining gas because we need to, to hit people in, uh, to solve the problems that uh, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is, is is causing, then we have another problem because we are going exactly in the opposite direction of the direction we should be going. So I am, not, I am optimistic about the fact that we may have scientific solutions, but I am pessimistic when I see that the inertia of the system and all these geopolitical dangers which we are facing, because then we will, this, the climate problem will be put behind. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Kailash, come in, but everybody's got to be quicker than they've been because we've got, we've got a lot to get through. So. <laughs> Everyone accelerate, please. Please. You miscalculated. Thank Sorry? you. I know, but I'm going to let Kailash speak. One, Kailash, you have no more than one minute. That was sure. So in first 10 seconds, I would like to congratulate these two young friends because they are the real heroes. If they started thinking in these terms about Pakistan, about compassion, it shows what I said this morning that the world is in good hands. Congratulations. I can't applaud that. <laughs> I can't applaud that. That's all. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, health. Uh, we, we're changing the order. We also talked about health after the pandem pandemic, uh, because my Brit won't be with us for the entire session, we're moving that up, because my Brit was our laureate in discussion with the young people. So are, they, are our two young people from health available? If you'd like to, hello, if you'd like to pop, come up, introduce yourselves very briefly, make your points, and then I'll have my Brit comment on it, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hello. Hello everyone, my name is Sani. I'm from Myanmar. I work in a 
uh, as a deputy director for NGO called Community Partners International. So uh, with the encouragement from Adam during our meeting, I'm going to drop another big question to the esteemed panel. Uh, what do you think? Is it held a personal responsibility or is it held a, a right, human right? So uh, when I talk about health, please keep in mind that uh, health is not, a, not only physical health, mental and social well-being as well. And uh, another fact that I would like to share is that uh, in UHC, we universal health coverage, every lot of countries, nearly 190 countries, signed the declaration that by the year 2030, we will try to achieve universal health coverage. We will achieve universal health coverage, actually. So how do we make the, uh, make the leaders keep their promise? How can we make sure that they are uh, well, uh, they use evidence-based uh, decision-making tools uh, available to them and make the best possible decision in order to achieve the future we want? Thank you very much indeed. And just to like carry on from that, I think one of the few things we talked about in today's panel was the role of technology, the positive impact of technology, and how technology can help improve equality across borders. So my question to the panel today would be, we see a lot of technology being developed in the global north countries, and these are being transferred to the global south countries, which is great. But the issue is this technology is not customized for the global south countries. So what do you think is the importance and how can we achieve elevating the lower income countries from an end user of technology to a, to a stakeholder in the development of this healthcare technology. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much indeed. <laughs> well, my Brit, um, whose responsibility is health? How can you keep, how can you make governments keep their pr promises and how can you involve the global south in the development of health technologies? Take your pick, address any of those three. My breath, please. Yeah, so of course, um, we always think about uh, the society in our own country that uh, it's that society or that government uh, who should take care of us. But uh, what we've seen through the pandemic is that um, all countries have to be responsible for all other countries. And I would like to say, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, my uh, favorite children singer, Maybrit Andersen, and she was singing uh, in, in the 70s about the earth as a balloon. And if you make that leaky, wherever it is, then it's falling apart. And I think that uh, this globalization has to come back uh, and now we've seen this movement of, of uh, uh, polarization and nas nationalism and so on and, and try to keep resources for ourselves. But we have to go back to what Kalaj said also, compassion. And if we don't, then it's going to hurt ourselves too. So it's better to start uh, now to try to, to make life uh, more equal throughout all countries and, and to lift the poor ones and, and the poor children who are suffering. That is extremely important. But I believe also, uh, like uh, Rosh said, that we need more science because with science things can become much more efficient and again, rich countries should spend more uh, money uh, on, on, on developing technology and science for all countries in the whole world. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, I, uh, Tegu, yep, I was going to come to Dame Sally. It's very much yeah. her province. But um, uh, Tegu, do you want to just reply yeah. quickly? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the issues of the health is human right or a personal right. I think the I don't want to say personal or human right, but this is the obligation of the of the country of the the government all over the world to to pat to their own uh, people to to provide the basic health services. Um, of course, that we using many channels, but no, we plan that we would like to have the universal health coverage. But the challenge, this is the, I would like to tell the story of Indonesia that we, 
already launched uh, universal health coverage in 2014. And yeah, the, the achievement, the co accomplishment is quite a while. But the issue when we establish the universal health coverage is about the communication between the politician, the public health or the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance. Because the Ministry of Health is always talking about the, the uh, health is the right, but the Ministry of Finance is always talking about the, the money. But when we, we talk together that the health is, is investment for the future, and then we provide the evidence based on the calculation, for example, that it, when we have like universal co uh, health coverage and how much uh, poverty can reduce, then if after we provide the evidence based policy and then the communications within the public, uh, sorry, uh, Ministry of Health and the Ministry of the Finance become uh, clear and better and then uh, have the same understanding. And then uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, would like to, to spend more money or support the, our universal health coverage. I think so, the evidence-based policy and the communication is, will be uh, very important to, to uh, realizing the universal health coverage. And the university uh, have to, to provide to support the government or to providing the evidence-based policy that this is a, a universal health coverage is the investment for the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Sally. So, of course, health is a human right. And we know that there are people who could have good health, but they are not fed properly. They don't have decent housing. They are suffering from pollution, whether it's from cooking or other reasons. And that's all part of the broader health, uh, which shows that it's not just a personal responsibility. And we have to make sure that across the world, everyone has a baseline of those of the right vaccinations, clean water, sanitation, and education, because all of those are essential to health. Then you get into the health interventions above and beyond that, and what can we afford where, and I'll just loop round to the technology. I, I think that we need much more innovation from the Global South. And I'm going to use the metaphor of the washing machine. I have a washing machine, and I think there are about 50 combinations that I can change on it. Yet I only use three programs. I was delighted to find an ultrasound for pregnant women uh, to look at the fetus coming from India that, that midwives and community workers could manage. Because our ultrasound in my local hospital is like my washing machine. It's so complex, but all the bits aren't used. It took India to say, we only need these bits. You can make it small, you can make it work. So we need the innovation that makes it easy and effective. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. I need to move on to economics. Economic well-being was the next theme we covered, but as the students come up, Kailash, do you want to make a point for 20 seconds? Yeah. Just to answer this question, I strongly believe that health must be a fundamental right. It should be human right. It should be constitutional right. There are people like Mary Britt and many other scientists who were driven by compassion, who were driven by their inner conscience, and rationals, reasoning, etc., and brought solutions to many of the health problems. But his medicines or um, the health solutions have been picked up by the industry and commercialized and sold. So people who can buy better health, they are happy. But most of the people in the world cannot buy um, as consumers. Uh, the best health facilities. And that's why ethically, morally, it is important that the sacrifice people like her and others have made in all their lives, the biggest tribute for them would be or should be that health should be made fundamental right in each country. It should not be commercialized. Education should not be commercialized. Some of those things which God has given to us, the water, the light, these things should be uh, public good and should not be commercialized. Thank, thank you. Can I just, Serge, did you want to jump in on this? <clears throat> yes, I, I agree with what, with, of course, with all what has been said. Uh, 
the problem is how to implement it, and this is a, again a, a huge problem. Uh, I know, for instance, that uh, what, what, you, what you said about the fact that you should have simpler instruments for health. I can give you an example. The MRI machines are hugely expensive because they need very large magnetic fields. I know that in a country like Brazil, scientists are trying to get machines working at lower frequency with smaller fields to make it much cheaper. So this is the kind of thing which should be developed and, uh, uh, and which, which give hope in, in the future for uh, the countries of the South. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, please come up. I think many of the issues we touch on overlap and so maybe comments can get shorter, time can get shorter, we can compress a little. Please, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Genofi. I'm a behavioral economist. Uh, I used to live in Zurich, Switzerland, but now I am in India. Um, anyway, so uh, given that a topic was economic well-being, you might think we're going to talk about GDP, Human Development Index, Happiness Index, but no. Uh, we actually spoke about what a satisfied life was, and we spoke about purpose, we spoke about meaning, um, but we did not, we kind of ran out of time and we didn't address the elephant in the room. So for the people who don't have food to eat, who don't have a roof over their head, who don't have clothes to wear, who have diseases at home, I don't think that they care about purpose or meaning in life. And it's much more dire. And um, we are at a bad state right now. There are so many people whose life is exactly what I just described. And the governments have failed us. And don't want to blame anyone here, but the previous generations have failed us. So we are at a terrible state, and uh, Jian has some questions that we would love to hear from you guys from. Yes. Um, I think another point as well before we raise the question is we also discuss about agency. So basically in economic policy makings, in these big decisions by governments, followed by corporations, how much of a say does the most affected communities, like impoverished, marginalized people, have a say other than the elites and the educated, uh, formally educated uh, people and people in power? So basically our question are two for the laureates. The first one is, uh, so basically how important is the voice and the experience of the most impoverished and marginalized people in economy? Should they be taken, uh, you know, uh, uh, considered or, or how do we consider them in economic policy making? And the second point is regarding the satisfactory life is, I'm sorry, I'm just a bit nervous here. I don't usually do this. <laughs> Do we work to live or do we live to work? And how do we find meanings in the middle of it? Especially just like Kala said and Juno said, some people living paycheck to paycheck, overwork, underpaid, unpaid internship for the young people, I hear you. How do we find meanings? And, and is it which one is most better, work to live or live to work? Those are our questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, purpose and meaning is one thing that was discussed. Um, Sally, you had something to say on purpose and meaning. Uh, there's a whole literature on this, and I felt that you've now brought out purpose and meaning more than I heard in the discussion, so I was pleased about that. The bit you didn't include, which I want to add, is someone to love. Um, and I, I think I would also pick up about working to live or living to work. We are blessed. We live and we enjoy working. The majority of people are not blessed in this way. So how do we ensure that in working, they are protected and having a decent life and getting what they need to take home for the rest of their life? So I think I'll leave it there. Mm. George, we haven't heard from you for a while, but Tegu, I also wanted you to bring you in. Do you want to go back? <laughs> well, I, I, I want to be controversial again. <laughs> okay, be controversial, but okay. brief. Non-complete non, uh, non human sovereignist. Look, people, it's time for people to grow up and act like civilized adults, right? And really think carefully about what you're doing and what the implication is for the world. And you don't give that Shiva has quit doing his dance on the dwarf of immortal, uh, the immortal dwarf of ignorance. And ignorance is out in the land, 
it's, it's observed in many democracies and many not democracies. And if you give the right to make decisions to people who don't understand the consequences of their decisions or think there's magic, that we can take the money from here and it'll be replenished instantly and then we can take some more, you know, helicopter money from the, from the <laughs> ECB, you're going to have a problem eventually. And you've got to actually think, how are you going to make society work? How are you going to behave in a reasonable way to get the future you want and also take care of the poor citizens? And I said, if I'd been back in the, in the late 70s when we were first studying this energy, looked at the thing, I would have said, I put a 5% tax on all energy projects and I would make sure everybody has some. But it's more, it's, you don't get to make that decision because there's 200 countries in the world and they all have their own opinion. And it's time, for, it's time for humans to grow up because humans are working on a planetary scale. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. I think everybody will want to comment on this. Serge <laughs> first and then the others. Yes, I, I think one of the questions which was asked is, should the economy work for the poor people? There have been some examples of that. I think there was a Nobel Prize in economy, I think a package, I forgot his name, but who got oh, a Nobel, yes. yes. Yes, he got a Nobel Prize to develop microcredit. Oh, that's, uh, Mohammed Yunus. Yes. Yes. He developed the microcredit, yeah. which is which is a way of banking which helps g yeah. giving small amounts of money for specific projects. It was very positive. Now, as op op opposite uh, side of, of the spectrum, you have some economic activities which are absolutely against that. For example, and, and this will relate us to the, one of the previous uh, discussion we had about, uh, about the digital world. Uh, there are algorithms which are developed which allow people to trade at a microsecond level, not microcredit, microsecond level. They can put orders on the internet, buy and sell. They can even cancel the order so they manipulate the market and make profit. And this is so important and so sophisticated developed by science that in fact, the office has to be closed to the stock market because the time it takes for life to propagate from one point to the other is, um, is important. So, and this is a way that finance is completely uh, using the economy in a perverse way. It's not to uh, satisfy supply and demand, it's just to satisfy fin financial gains. And, and we have, in all fields, we have this opposition between what should be done what are the moral values and the ethical values, and what happens in the real world, which is, due, which is fueled by greed and by, by uh, uh, this, this kind of thing. And this happened all the time. If you come back to the Middle Ages, you would have found people who said that uh, the poor should be helped and so on, and you had terrible wars and massacres and everything. What is terrible is that the, the progress in science and the progress in knowledge in general is not accompanied by the same kind of progress in moral values and civilization. And we, we are paying this the price now. Thank you. Tego, you're dean of an economics department. How okay. important is the voice of the impoverished? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very important question. This is the basic question about the, the policy or intervention. So the purpose of the policy of intervention is to improve the well-being for those disadvantaged group. So the voice of the poor or disadvantaged group is very important because as, uh, if they are voiceless, then the policy that implemented by the government will be misled or maybe benefited for only those in, in uh, middle class or upper class. So the voice is very important, but the, the question is how to, to pick up the, the aspiration of the disadvantaged group. So this is very important to to NGO or, or non-profit uh, organization to voice uh, the poor or the disadvantaged group because they, they don't have uh, any channel to, to voicing their, their aspiration. So they need help. The second question is about work to life or, or life to work is the same the question that it to live or live, uh, life to, to eat. If you can answer the question, maybe the, the, uh, the, the answer is correct. But for me, I think it's uh, uh, not uh, life to, to work, but work to life. So you can enjoy the life, enjoy the well-being, and then you can do 
with the very proper way in, in job and then you can optimizing uh, your potential uh, in, in working or with contributing purpose or anything if you choose the uh, uh, work to, to life. But uh, not uh, life to work, so it will be like uh, the messing, I think. Thank you. Kanash, I know you want to come in, but we're going to move on to now to the theme of education, which is very much your area. So sure, let's, I, have edu let, yeah. let's have the educa educational well-being <coughs> young people. Thank you very much indeed. Carry on, keep going. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi. Tell us who you are and go ahead. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm David Shi, a medicine student from the Australian National University. Uh, and I'm Jackie, I'm an MD PhD candidate from Duke and US Singapore. And it is our absolute pleasure to be representing views from today's uh, rich panel discussion on youth education, which consisted of the Nobel Prize laureate, George Smoot, Anna Di Edio, and Tegu Dutanto. Um, the whole panel agreed that youth education is key to unlocking several UN targets, and we've identified four key themes that emerged from today's discussion. The first theme was socioeconomic inequities in access to youth education in developing countries. And the key issues discussed were the need to address poor infrastructure, lack of resources, and lack of good quality teachers, and lack of access of training and leadership for the teachers, which perpetuates the cycle of poverty and trap. And the intergenerational transfer of deprivation for good education, nutrition, health facilities, and job opportunities for these communities. The second theme that emerged from the discussion was gender disparities and issues related to intersectionality. And the key issues under this theme were um, the importance of inclusion, especially investment in women education and leadership, and the need for breaking down sociocultural barriers in the access to education, early marriages, pregnancy, responsibility to motherhood, domestic violence, and battling the conservative and patriarchal beliefs of gender roles and norms. Okay, so the third theme is about education and meritocracy. So, um, so there are two aspects. One is um, as we know, equal access to education, of course, Dia has mentioned that um, it's still a problem in many um, um, places around the world. Um, but even if we have, uh, you know, equal access to education, regardless of gender, races, or other factors, then the second issue is, you know, um, whether we can, we can really promote social mobility from education because, you know, um, parents from, from the, the high social class, they, they may have more investments or resources um, devoted to their kids um, such that they have high educational level. Um, so, so this is the third aspect. So the fourth aspect uh, is about the meaning or the purpose of education. Um, uh, as as uh, Professor George Smoot said, you know, it's, education is for us to prosper. Um, it's for us to um, equip us with, with skills for us to survive in, in, in different environments. So, and, and also it will equip us with different um, skills like critical thinking and other valuable assets that it's just not just about road memorization. So I would like to ask the panel is, um, I've, asked Esther, I've asked Esther the same question. So do you think education is a way to promote social mobility? Um, if not, then how can we work on it? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. There was, there was a lot in there. Um, Kalash, over to you. I would love to discuss the meaning of education in a few minutes, in a couple of minutes, but go, please. Well, before we discuss about the meaning of education, which is a theoretical question, let me remind you that today when we are sitting here, we are all educated in a way. <clears throat> but this is the time when almost 200 children who have to be in primary and secondary education, they are not. And out of them, almost 40 million have never seen the doorstep of school. They have never touched the books and pencils. One out of 12, 11 or 12 people in the world could not read and, read and write, the adult people. So this is the situation of education. 
But when we talk of ensuring education for all children, it requires 40, 39 to be precise, billion dollars to ensure primary and secondary education for all children. And that is less than a week of global military expenditure. So this is not something which is uh, a rocket science or which is unattainable and so on. It's a matter of priority, it's a matter of political will. When we say that these 200 million children have to be in schools, this means we are denying their fundamental right. We are also uh, not following the commitment, not, uh, uh, not adhere to our own commitment to ensure primary and secondary education for all children under the development, Sustainable Development Goal 4. And that has to be done before 2030. Having said that, I'll come back to the question. Education is the most powerful emancipator, liberator. <coughs> education liberates our minds and must liberate our minds. It should remove the layers of all those wrongs, all those evils, all those misleading uh, notions from our mind. So education is liberator, physically, mentally, spiritually, economically. The second is education must be empowering. It is not a charity. It is not just one of the development agendas. It should be empowering. People feel empowered. It empowers, definitely. That is the third, second thing. Education must be equalizer. Unfortunately, we have created a world of education where it begins with disparities and inequalities. As I was saying that when it becomes a merchandise, when it becomes a commodity, then the richest rich people can buy the most expensive education and the poor people are denied education or get very, very poor quality education. And that is again the commitment to ensure quality education, quality public education that should be inclusive as well as uh, uh, it should uh, have lifelong learning. That is the part of it. So the third thing, as I said, it should be equalizer. And fourth thing, that education should be empathizer. It should create, it should generate empathy within us and also uh, unleash much of the potential which all of us have. But definitely education should have its component of employability. Uh, we cannot generate it, so many employment, but we can definitely build the employment, uh, employability through education, uh, through skills and other things. Thank you. But most important thing is that until and unless we universalize education and make sure that everyone gets good quality, free public education, inclusive education, uh, we are not going to bring about sustainability and peace in the world. And that's why the young people's voice matter a lot. If they speak on behalf of those who are denied education, I'm sure that we will move forward and we can achieve the goals. It is not so difficult. It's again a matter of priority. Thank you. Sir, yes, I, of course I agree with what has been said, which is very important. What I want to say is that to have a good education, you have to have good teachers and a lot of teachers, and this costs a lot of money. <laughs> and I think that the government should, in all countries, should understand that investing in education is important and that teachers are as important as engineers. And if you look at the salaries, you find that teachers in most countries are very poorly paid compared to what you pay an engineer or some, someone doing a some kind of work for private companies. And this should be changed. And the second thing I would like to say is that it's 
indeed heartbreaking to see that hundreds of millions of people have never had education and are denied education. I think it is even more heartbreaking to think that some people who got education are now deprived of it. And I am thinking about the girls in Afghanistan who have spent 20 years uh, in the situation which was prevailing before, which we, we were able to get education, to have aspiration, and who have now shut completely from education, are forbidden to be educated beyond elementary school. And I think this is heartbreaking. It's an awful situation which, which we should think about. But again, as for the other geopolitical problems that we faced before, we have no solution. We can only say that it's terrible, but it's, it's really terrible that we don't find a solution for these problems. Thank you. Um, we're so tight for time, but I really want quick comments. Dave Sally, you find yourself now leading a hugely elitist educational institution, Trinity College, Cambridge. What, what would you comment on? Well, I think it does show the importance of education and how it can give social mobility. We've been steadily increasing the number of young people we take from non-elite backgrounds because they're bright, mm. they're the best. And yes, they don't know the table manners that have always been used. That doesn't matter. What matters is they have a thirst for knowledge and they can learn. So the thing that we have, um, we have to find more and more scholarships so that we can make it needs blind so we can take the best from all around the world who will benefit from it. Thank you. And George, a very quick comment. <coughs> you're the only laureate here who has, in fact, you're the only laureate who has won the competition something, what's it called? So you think it's you're- Smarter than a fifth grader? So you think you're smarter <laughs> than a fifth grader. <laughs> so that surely- in It's fact, not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Obviously not, you're the only one who won. Um, so uh, that surely entitles you to make some quick comment on this. Uh, I, I, my, they keep getting it wrong. The students unfortunately get this wrong and I corrected them once. It's important for us to understand that the purpose of education is to allow people to prosper in, in the world. And that in the future, and that the present is going to mean continuing education through your whole life. We have to look at the education system and think about how are we going to train people to keep learning for their whole life because the world is going to be changing. Thank you. Is there anybody who would like to disagree with anything that was said there or add to it? <laughs> no? Everybody happy with that definition of education? I, I can add one sentence. Go on then. I completely disagree with any education which divides humanity. Education which creates layers on your minds. Education that make you slave of certain beliefs. Mm -hmm. Education should be liberator and then only we can liberate this world from many of those crises which we are facing today. Thank you. I don't think that those two views were incompatible. Um, the, um, the last thing we considered was happiness, which in a way encapsulates everything else that was talked about. Um, the pursuit of happiness is what the session was called. May we have our two representatives from that discussion as our last one. Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Emma. I'm an undergraduate in psychology in NUS, Singapore. Um, so um, earlier on in our discussion, a part of it we discussed about how happiness is actually self-defined and the pursuit of happiness is a journey that um, we have to walk on our own essentially. Um, and so to achieve that, we have to be in touch with our emotions and be self-aware to some extent. Um, on that end, we've also noticed that actually there's some sort of gender disparity between how women are often more um, emotional than men. So on that end, I would like to ask, can men be afford to be more emotional? What are your thoughts on it? And can we encourage men to be more emotional? Thank you. <laughs> yes.
<laughs> I think I think that's an important uh, question that we did the panel because this is more of like more men panel. <laughs> we were all women when when we were discussing happiness. Come 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 here. Sit here. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Now your turn. You have to sit once. I'm sorry. Sit here. Sit here. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay, let's, let's, let's do it together. Let's do it together. Oh my together, God. Together. Together. Oh together. What are you gonna do? Please, please. I, I, I request you. I request you. You challenged us. This is impromptu, right? guys. The men are also emotional. <laughs> Oh my God! Okay. Lovely. Okay. Thank you so much. Ask the um, so for my question, actually, it was also brought about earlier about um, the the challenge of the young ones, like uh, they they are not uh, the the Asian reproduction, like the aging society right now. So uh, my question is, since uh, we all have influence, uh, how would you like to influence the young ones to ensure to you know to uh, ensure that they, we will be making a, a society of compassion, as you've said, and a society that would support uh, maybe the, the, the future children that we have so that they would be encouraged maybe <laughs> to reproduce and um, you know, uh, create the future that we want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I think you can stay. Here. I think you better stay. You better stay. <laughs> Carlos has told you to stay. You stay. <laughs> This is okay. Yeah. Now there are too many women. No, no. <laughs> George. Um, would you like a seat? No, 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 You're happy? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Um, we get, no, we no, got, no. I, got, I'll answer. We got answer. two. We got two questions to be dealing with, and the lo the second one was a great one to finish on. How should the elder generation influence the younger generation? Let's finish. Let's make that the closing question on this question of making men more emotional. Um, Dame Sally, can I, shall I come to you first? It's a bit unfair, but what do you think of that question? I'm often the token woman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> many men have uh, grown up in cultures where they don't express their emotions. Um, and the British culture is one of those. There are times when the stiff upper lip is quite useful. Uh, and I don't want lots of emotion everywhere in the workplace. I want to get on with work. So I think there's a nice balance, and we want everyone to feel comfortable, and I would like men to feel able to express their emotions if it will help them. But um, I don't want, I'm very British, I don't want emotion anywhere. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. it, it, no, I, it was no, it, no. It you're, was. You, you're you're just a, a product of your culture. Yeah. So, <laughs> Serge, the French are emotional. Tell us about it. I I, I think we lived through a, a, a moment of happiness uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's true that it's uh, that men express their emotion less than men uh, than women, e even in France. And uh, maybe if uh, women, uh, some people have said that, uh, there is a public, there is a kind of common wisdom saying that if more women were in power, there would be less wars. I am not so sure. If you take the example of uh, Margaret Thatcher, it was not <laughs> quite clear. Or ev even Elizabeth I, it was not a clear example of that. Uh, so uh, it's debatable, but. Uh, I don't, I don't know what, what more to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, George, take over. Uh, really? A quick comment on, on emotion. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, I think having emotion is important, <laughs> but there are times when you want to have more rational thinking. The humans, my friends are behavioral economics people, and they, they point out that unlike the classical economics I learned in college, where humans did the optimum thing for each other, that humans make mistakes and they're driven by their emotion and so forth. And then when it comes to making important decisions, it's important to do what's called long, slow thinking, and analytical thinking, mm -hmm. and look at the problem. And then also look at it from an emotional point of view. Sometimes when I face really important decisions, 
I make a plus and minus column and so forth. And then I flip a coin, and if I'm happy with the answer, then it's good. <laughs> and if I'm unhappy, I've got to add some stuff to the con list. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, emotions are part of being human. Mistakes are part of being human. And uh, careful analytical thinking should be part of being human, but for many people it's not. And so I think that it's true, it's important that men recognize their emotions and, and have them. You really want them to say how beautiful you are and they love you, but that's, <laughs> that's a different emotion than we're talking about. It's, it's, it's actually an important part of the pursuit of happiness and a balanced life. And no one could say that the pursuit of science is unemotional either, but that's another, question. That's another debate. OK, let's come to that final question. Let's finish now. Um, what, how can the elder generation influence the younger generation? Although, I, can I just say, that there was, I once witnessed a debate between a very old Nobel laureate in his 80s, and, or not a debate, a conversation, and 200 young people. And after a while, they were asking all these questions. The 80-year-old the stopped them for a while and said, listen, you're all sitting there looking at me thinking, how can anybody be that wise? And also, how can anybody be that old? <laughs> but what you fail to realize is that inside this body, I feel exactly the same as you do inside. And I don't know whether that was true, that the older generation and the younger generation feel exactly the same all the time, but it was an interesting observation. Anyway, um, Tegu, what can the elder generation how can the elder generation influence the younger generation? I think uh, the important thing for elder generation is like uh, to provide the equal opportunity to young people to explore and yeah, the world and uh, just uh, provide the equal opportunity, especially in education, uh, especially for those uh, from dis disadvantaged group, so they can um, mobile in uh, social mobility and when we provide the equal opportunity for the young generation and then let them write the future of our story. Thank you very much. Kalash. Well, um, I would say that um, you should not be influenced by elderly people. The young generation does not need an influence of youth. Of, of elderly people, old people. You have to find your own way because your minds, your hearts are stronger, purer. You have much more energy. You have much more enthusiasm. You have much more passion. You have much more clarity of mind. So we should learn from you. Old people are not going to give you the driving seat. You have to grab it. The young people should sit on the driving seat. Only then the world would be a better place. If you are always influenced by what we say and hide behind the answers we give, then there would be layer and layer and layers of answers. Then you will lose how to question and what to question and why to question. So it is important. The second thing is that I always say, that if we have to be happy, we have to learn one thing, which I tried to learn in my life. If somebody is, is simple, not artificial, clean-hearted, if somebody has forgiveness, if somebody is loving and caring and kind and compassionate, it is not because that person is very, very rich, very educated academician, or a powerful person. It does not come through that. I have never seen the richest of the rich happy. I have never seen the most powerful people happy. I have never seen the most knowledgeable people happy from inside. But how one can be happy, if these people are still happy, some people are happy, it is because they have their inner, inner child intact inside them. Because they kept and nursed that child. For me, childhood does not mean age. 
it means simplicity it means truthfulness it means originality not artificiality it means forgiveness it means kindness so if these traits human traits are inside us they will make us happy so i ask all of you i request all of you that try to acknowledge and find that inner child inside you if you are good at anything in your life it is because that child is still alive if you become completely artificial if you wanted to cry you control your emotion oh i cannot cry otherwise people will think that we are weak why don't you cry if you are able to cry means you are more courageous person if you are hiding your emotions it means you are not that courageous so be free to cry free to laugh free to enjoy fullest of your childhood and whole of your life it does not mean only 6 7 8 12 13 15 year old children are children any one of us can live like a child and i finally say that the world is very beautiful though so many problems are there but the world is very beautiful the only condition is that you look at the world with a child's eye <laughs> you can forgive you can forget and then you will learn new things and you can become happy thank you i'll tell i'll tell you something thank you i'll tell you something else about children they don't listen to instructions and evidence of the childish nature of our panel which is a compliment is that they don't listen to instructions to be brief <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think you, you contradicted yourself. You started by saying you should not listen to old people. <laughs> Then you gave a lot of <laughs> <laughs> the, the life is full of contradictions. <laughs> Then you have to find the middle path sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, Dave Sally, if you want to, you want to, you want to answer that question very briefly. We really got to finish. So how do we influence the younger generation? Oh, we can we... do it in part by example. Um, are we working with purpose, to purpose? Um, are we people that you respect, admire, and would wish to follow, not in our steps, but um, take the morality of it? We can mentor, which is different from teaching. It's listening, it's supporting. And the third thing is we can give you space to do things which is your driving seat but it's space and i would say please take it we need you and if you look at innovation it comes from the young it doesn't come from us so take that space it's yours george oh you're going to let me talk <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to keep it short that is the happiness is yours You don't get happiness from anybody else. You get it from yourself. You're responsible for your own happiness. It's a luxury. It's high on the pyramid of needs. If I turned on the pump and sucked all the air out of this room, you guys would really want oxygen more than you want happiness at the moment. But the fact is, we live in an environment where we have many of our basic needs met, and we can have the luxury of seeking happiness. But as Felicia said, Find the happiness in you. You're responsible for your happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last word to you, please. You raise the question. What do you, what? Yeah. To me. To you. Um, uh, it's not every day that a Lord <laughs> will give us a seat, mm -hmm. but when, as you've seen earlier, um, as youth representatives, we're quite hesitant to take the seat. But it was highlighted that um, this is our time, and it it it. it It's um, it's a perfect time for us to, you know, take that seat, be responsible, and you know, um, help the future generation and work together uh, to create a future that we want. And I'm really grateful, and it, it's an honor. It's really a great honor to be in this. <laughs> I, 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 we we are both um, shocked, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, it it represents how the youth. Like we have those uh, questions in our hearts that we don't want to speak out, but we have to 
we have to uh, share that and we have to take the seat and move towards where we want to go. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's been truly inspiring to be part of all these conversations with you and your colleagues um, in the days leading up to this dialogue and uh, during today's dialogue. And thank you to all my wonderful panelists and to the audience for being with us. And now we will leave the stage and pass over to Kishore Mabubani, who is known to many of you, I'm sure all of you, former UN and uh, Singapore's UN, uh, ambassador to the UN. Um, and he is going to reflect on the day's discussions and give us his thoughts. So thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. You know, I've been given many missions impossible in my life. This is the most impossible mission. To speak after a panel of Nobel uh, Prize winners and to speak about the day. But let me make the most obvious point. I think we in Singapore are truly privileged to have spent this day with people who could have traveled all over the world, spoken anywhere in the world, and decided to come to Singapore. So a round of applause for them. <laughs> and to the Yong Lulian School of Medicine for sponsoring this wonderful event. A round of applause for them too. I, I also know that I stand between you and dinner. <laughs> and it's almost nine o'clock. So I'll be very brief in trying to capture hopefully the essence of today. As you know, the, the topic is the future we want. And all of us want a better future. And if you are going to learn lessons from today, it's important for us to recognize that in every dimension of life, things are also going to be difficult. There are going to be contradictions that we have to deal with. So I'm just going to quickly mention three, and I'll speak for five minutes or so. Let me assure you of this. <laughs> Number one is obviously the contradiction between idealism and realism. Two, the contradiction between techno-optimism, which Minister Vivian Balakrishnan spoke about, and techno-pessimism. And three, the contradiction between planet and country. I want to touch on these three because today what we saw, especially with Kailash, was a tremendous amount of idealism. I know that every Singapore mother would disapprove of him because he gave up his lucrative career as an engineer to go and try and save the children, children of India, children of the world, and he succeeded. But most people would say that kind of idealism doesn't work in our world, right? But he, he, he persisted and he succeeded. And therefore, he's clearly a source of inspiration to all of us. But we also know that in the real world, you have to balance this idealism with a sense of realism. Because for all the idealism in the world cannot get rid of some of the critical problems that we face. For example, we cannot stop the war in Ukraine today. We just can't. We also know that for all the idealism in the world, we cannot stop a major geopolitical contest from breaking out. And what's even more shocking, for all the idealism we have in the world, we are today closer to a global nuclear war than we have been in a long time, especially over what's happening in Taiwan. So that's the contradiction of our world. We want to change it, we want to make it better, but we have a real world that is becoming more difficult. The second contradiction between techno-optimism and techno-pessimism, you can see that all these Nobel Prize winners have transformed the world. 
especially with the incredible discoveries in the field of science. And that's why the human condition has improved dramatically. That's why each and every one of, uh, of us in this room, we're gonna have growing life expectancy as a result of all the work that they have done. We will lead a better life. But yet, at the same time, even in the field of science and technology, is now becoming fractured in a way that has never been fractured before. Technological advances were supposed to create one humanity. Please expect humanity to be divided. And here what I found amazing, listening to George Smoot this morning and watching his depictions of the International Space Station, the space is so enormous. The Earth is insignificant. Why are we human, human beings disagreeing about cooperating in outer space? Madness, right? Absolute madness. And yet the International Space Station, which allows Russians, will not allow Chinese. That is an indication of how the divisions in planet Earth are being carried all the way out to outer space. And finally, with the third contradiction within planet and country, every one of us in this room agrees that climate change is urgent. I'm really glad that those two students showed the charts of climate justice. It's made it very, very clear that the global north is responsible for almost 90% of our historical emissions. The global south has contributed so little, right? So logically, the global north should be doing much more to stop climate change. It's their responsibility historically. And yet, the one country that walked away from its responsibilities on climate change is the richest, most educated, most sophisticated society in the world that has produced more Nobel Prize winners than any other society, and that society, United States, walked away from this climate change. Isn't that amazing? And you say, okay, that's only Donald Trump. But what's even more shocking is that Donald Trump may come back. And I'm serious. If you look at the Republican Party today and the control he has over the party, how he can ex Liz Cheney, the daughter of the powerful vice president, his power is real. Why does that happen? Because politicians are elected not to take care of our planet, but to take care of their country. And so our system, global system, is fundamentally at fault if we can't take care of our planet. So I only mention these three contradictions not to dampen you, but to tell you that we can make the world a better place, but to do so, let's balance our idealism with our realism, our techno-optimism with techno-pessimism, and balance our desire to improve our country with our desire to improve our planet. And I hope that that's the message we will take away from this wonderful dialogue today. Thank you very much.